I'd like to tell you a story of a very persistent character. She's always one step ahead of us, beckoning us forwards to Wonderland, to the future. She's called One Lonely Thought. But sometimes we humans get stuck in our little ruts, we cruise in the middle lane, and we ignore what she's telling us. We miss the signals to come forward, to change, and to progress. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about how One Lonely Thought has moved through time and changed our perception. And we're going to start with a quiz. So I want your hands up or shout out, I don't mind which. Who was the first to discover that the Earth was round? Was it Columbus, Galileo, or Magellan? Who's for Columbus? That's good. Galileo? Oh, better. What about Magellan? Ooh, Magellan was actually the first to organize the circumnavigation of the world in the early 1500s. But I've misled you. I'm really sorry. It was a trick question. It was the ancient Greeks almost two and a half thousand years ago. Pythagoras and then subsequently Aristotle worked out using maths that the Earth could be nothing other than round. But this thought didn't catch on for the best part of 2,000 years. One lonely thought had a tough time. And most of us thought the Earth was flat. Some of us apparently still do. <laughs> Let me give you another example, and I promise no more trickery. So this is another question. I want you to call out the answer to me. And I'm after an invention, OK? So what was it when it was carried through the streets of London in 1750 by its inventor that caused public outrage, people to shout and hurl abuse and chastise and throw rotten fruit and veg? and even for one person to attempt to kill him. Any ideas? No, not quite, not quite. Here's a clue. That's it, umbrella it was, well done. Give yourself a round of applause, great one. Something as inoffensive as an umbrella. Jonas Hanway was the inventor of the umbrella. Here he is, parading through the streets. He'd been on a trip to France and he'd seen the parasol there shielding French ladies from the bright sunshine. And he thought, one lonely thought, wouldn't it be great to take this back to Blighty where it buckets down with rain all the time and waterproof it? So he did. And as I said, he was derided for his genius. Now, the person that tried to kill him was actually a cab driver of the day who ran a horse and carriage. And the reason for that was because this disruptive technology was letting people walk in the rain rather than hail a cab. So you could say that the umbrella was the Uber of its day. <laughs> it took 50 years to catch on before it became socially acceptable. It was quite an astonishing amount of time. And the amazing thing was, 44,250 millimeters of rain needlessly fell on people's head during that time. <laughs> one lonely thought. OK, one more. Which one lonely thought binds these gentlemen together, and I'm afraid they are all gentlemen. Any ideas? Actually, if you're in Kate Griggs' talk this morning, you may have a clue, bottom right. The light bulb, yes, that's right, thank you very much. Give yourself a round of applause for getting that one right, thank you, sir. Now, this is the emblem of creativity, isn't it? This is what we always put up when we're thinking smart, but it took 80 years from its first incarnation through to going commercial in 1879. And even then, people thought it was a bad idea. This is what the British government said of it. Can you believe this? Unworthy of the attention of practical or scientific men. It was a parliamentary committee. These are politicians. So now we know we can trust every word they say. <laughs> The chief engineer of the post office called it an absolute ignis fatuous. I don't know what it means, but it sounds rude, so I put it on the slides. <laughs> no, it means will of the wisp. It means it'll be gone in a flash, but it shows you how wrong he was. Interestingly, though, one man, a banker called J.P. Morgan in New York, recognized Edison's one lonely thought and put a lot of money into it. Together, they built a power network in New York City, and they lit up Manhattan with a generator, with a grid, and with the electric light bulbs that they sold. And even then, you'd think, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? But not everybody thought so. Another notorious New York businessman called Rockefeller thought otherwise. 
he was an oil man. And for every house that was lit electrically, he was losing a customer because previously he'd been supplying kerosene to power the oil lamps to light that house. Thankfully, Morgan and Edison bust on through. Edison said, you can try and stop me all you like, but you're going to have to do it in the dark. So, one lonely thought. During the break, some of you were given something. And we're going to go on to that in a moment, so just fish it out. I'd like to share with you my one lonely thought. And when I do, I'd like you to go, ooh, because it's bold. So we're going to have to get our balls out. Now, thankfully, they're not balls of steel, but is everybody ready? Because we'd like to create an umbrella moment. When I tell you my one lonely thought, I want you to pretend I'm Hanway, deride me, and hurl the balls at me. We did ask the theatre if we could use fruit and veg, but they wouldn't let us. So, and I have no umbrella to hide behind, so you're going to have to hit me. So if you want, stand up, get your balls at the ready, and when I show you my one lonely thought, hit me with it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Good. I'm not sure I am. <laughs> you look very intimidating. OK, let's go. My one lonely thought is that Britain will be powered entirely by renewables within my lifetime. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Got it. Thank you so much. <laughs> There you go, you can have it back. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Now, I can see some people's faces over here saying, nah, that's never going to happen. Not in this guy's lifetime. Look how old he is. <laughs> <laughs> and I admit, I haven't got too much youth left on my side. But I'd like to just tell you a couple of points why I think it will. So the first, some big data. If we could capture just one hour's worth of sunshine that hits the world's surface, would power the entire planet's energy needs for a year. Similarly, if we could trap 2% of the wind that circumnavigates our globe every day, we'd power the entire needs of civilization. They're not that big a number of numbers, are they? 1%, one hour, sorry, 2%, not huge. Let's just look at a couple of facts and figures, and I'll be quick on these. Two-thirds of all new generation that's being built today around the world is renewable. Admittedly, it's not all renewable yet, but it's rapidly moving that way. And I can hear one or two thinking over here, what about Hinckley? What about Hinckley? Well, I'm not so sure we're going to get Hinckley. The politicians tell us we are, but we've already seen what we can think of what they tell us. So what about Britain? Well, last year, 25% of all our energy was from renewables. It's a little-known fact little secret, if you like. And this year, it's 30%. That's a massive leap in less than 12 months. So we're well on our way. And the important point to note here is that that's for all our energy, for everything, for industry, for businesses, for offices, schools, and our homes. But if we were to channel it just to our homes, that renewable energy would power about 70% of all the places where we live. So we're well on our way. Technology. In the 80s, when turbines were first starting to be deployed commercially, you could pick up one of the blades and carry it around. They were quite small, quite light. But today, they're massive. They're like blue whale. Just look at that thing. That's in the Siemens factory. It's an absolute thing of beauty, isn't it? And this is actually the casting, the molding, for the underside of one of the blades, 75 meters long. By 2020, these blades could be as long as 180 meters some engineers are saying. So they're absolutely enormous, which shows the power and the scale of renewables that many people might not realize exists. Let's look at generation, where it's coming from. A hundred years ago, we had about 100 generators in Britain. 10 years ago, it was around about 10,000. And today, we have 100,000 or so commercial generators. But the killer is this. We have a million of us that have got solar panels on our roofs. We're all becoming generators. Now, that slowed down a little bit because of a change in subsidy, but the price of renewables, of panels, of photovoltaics, is plummeting. It's becoming really, really cheap, 
and it's only going to be getting cheaper. And it's not just panels that people might be using. You may have heard of roof tiles. They're coming our way soon. And you may have even heard of solar glass. So the windows that we're going to be putting in our homes in future will generate electricity for us renewably. So there's going to be more diversification of where our power is coming from. Now, renewables have a problem. If it's not windy, you don't get the turbine turning. If it's not sunny, your photovoltaic panel won't work. It's called intermittency. Now, the solution to this is batteries. And you're going to hear a lot more about batteries over the coming years. This is one that's just gone online in Sheffield. It's operated by Eon. It's an industrial grade battery. It's in the foreground of the photograph. It's the size of four shipping containers or half a million mobile phone batteries. And that stores the energy that's generated during the day from sunlight, perhaps, or wind for use when we need it or when renewables aren't generating so much power. But batteries also come in pocket size. And I forecast that within about five, maybe 10 years, we're all going to have a battery at home. And it's going to be kitchen unit size. And it will fit alongside your other one lonely thoughts. You know, your fridge, your freezer, your washing machine, those kind of things. It'll just sit in the kitchen. Or you might live in a very smart apartment like this one in Germany, where there's a Sonnen battery, the biggest manufacturer of batteries for domestic use in the world, sitting on your wall, almost like a piece of art or a piece of furniture. We'll get used to this stuff. And then lastly, why will this one lonely thought come true in my lifetime? Well, it's because of climate change. Now, we all know this is a major, major problem. But as a country, we've committed to do everything we can to stop it. We've got a carbon budget, which is to get us down to 80% emissions of the greenhouse gases that we throw out as a country from the 1990 levels by 2050. Now, some scientists say that's not enough, but it's showing progress. And it's worth remembering that's for all energy. So that's the generation that we use for electricity, but it's for transport, and it's also for heating and for commercial and industrial use. So if we can get the electric grid entirely renewable, we'll be well on our way to meeting that target. Now, what did I do to try and fulfill this little ambition? My one lonely thought. Well, earlier this year, with friends, we formed Pure Planet. It's a renewable energy company. It sells 100% green electricity to British households. A couple of weeks ago, we did a survey at Pure Planet, and we polled the British public, and we asked them a couple of questions. 64% said they want to live in a carbon-neutral Britain now. 64%, two-thirds of the population. It's an enormous number. Get the message. They understand pollution's bad. They just want it cleaned up. That's what they want to do. But also, tellingly, less than 1% of us have actually deliberately chosen a green tariff to power our homes so far. So there's a long way to go. So I have a small ask of you, which is when you go home tonight, when you reflect on what you've heard today, please keep one thought in mind. Can you help me get to that one lonely thought before we have to pop off? Because if you switched your home to green energy, you'd save around about four tons of CO2 needlessly entering our atmosphere by that switch every year. That's on average and typical, obviously. It may vary depending on the size of your home and what tariff you have today. But that's something worth having, isn't it? Four tons. And if everybody in the theater did it, well, we'd be nearly 5,000 tons. So there's an interesting ask for us all to consider today. So I've not got long left in this talk, <laughs> or possibly in life. So I'd urge you, please, choose renewables. There are several other companies. They're all progressive, and they're all good. Some are still a little bit more expensive than others, so watch for those. But you can. Be more Edison and be more Hanway. Thank you.